the stream. So we um, are alive. Uh, yeah, and just, something they've already uh, sold millions of. It's hard to say that they they have an optic problem, but uh, well, no, no, no. But I mean, uh, uh, they've certainly sold. Le uh, okay, I would say that that my perception is that uh, that they they have not nearly been as crystal clear as to what the tangible benefit to the consumer is on this as they mm -hmm. have as they were with the with the iPhone. Well, I mean, again, because the iPhone is like, hey, we have these things called phones. And they're kind of crappy. We have a better phone. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not questioning why we got there. I'm just, I'm just assessing where we are. But I don't. But I guess what I'm saying is that you're looking at like, did you order one? Oh, sure, 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 sure. Okay. But I'm, I'm already in, and I already, I already know exactly what the benefit is for me. It's a, it's a Pebble that's integrated into the iOS ecosystem that will work 100% of the time. And that, see, and that's just it. Is it like for me? Like, I guess with the iPhone, it's easy. Everybody, you all want this one thing because the Apple Watch does a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. For some people, like I want a better fitness tracker. Me, I'm lazy. I don't need a better fitness tracker. I want a better way to like make notes and do stuff like that. And so I guess that's the situation. You know, when it. By the it, way, ever since you introduced the idea of the of the uh, assisted dictation stuff with like double tapping oh and all. god Wouldn't god it's like i'm just like it's all i want uh i i know you're on a tight schedule justin um can you give me some chatter so we can set levels and we'll just jump right in yeah uh one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirty forty fifty six and beautiful 17, 18, you got it you got it you got it you win awesome uh, all right and i will press record in five four three two one Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. What's up? Hello, people. And Justin Robert Young. Yo, this is Justin Robert Young. <laughs> oh, man, I was ready for a fat bass drop after that. I was ready for a beat to come in. I was ready for, <laughs> for, for, for booty shorted dancers to come in by. Man, that's, I'm in, I'm in uh, the booty shorted dancer capital of North Carolina. <laughs> Where in Ohio is that exactly? That's uh, Southern Ohio. Okay, got it. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I have an opportunity for you. What is okay. it? Uh, you guys, you guys been watching Daredevil? You like it? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm trying real hard to catch up. I'm, I'm assuming you've already finished, right? No, no, I've, I've been, I've been very. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to binge watch it. I enjoy every one, and I don't want to just rush right through and be like, like it's like I love Game of Thrones because I get that one episode a week to to, to mull over, you know, as much as to be like, ah, I want to watch it all. Like, no, like appreciate it, savor it. Well, and so the the, the weird thing is, I find myself rewatching Daredevil as like uh, we tried to get uh, uh, Neshcom really excited about it, so I rewatched episode two. I wanted to experience episode four first from the experience as of a blind person only listening to it because they have <laughs> because they have that new uh, that new descriptive yeah. track, which is amazing. It's like it turns it into an audiobook, and in fact, Bonnie has experienced most of the episodes of Daredevil with her phone in her pocket listening to the descriptive audio track uh, and experiencing it as a radio drama. And then I went back really? and, yeah, and I went back and watched it again to, to notice the difference. I spent all this time not knowing what the two uh, uh, Russian brothers looked like because I experienced that whole thing while I was riding my bike. And so now I'm, I'm up to like episode eight or maybe, yeah, I think, I think I'm at episode eight now. We're not here for a Daredevil discussion. Sorry uh, about that. We're here for a discussion about superpowers. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so do you guys want superpowers? Well, heck yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, man. No, I love superpowers. They're great. Um, so here's my offer to you. How would you like to have, I don't know, be as like strong as five men? Uh, in, uh, in. Wait, okay. five five me's or five like real men? Five men, five like 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 five real, five yeah, burly like, soldiers men. or cops or whatever. You're strong as five. Is of that them. that would definitely be like the genie gambit, right? It's like ah, now you are the power of five, Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, so would you like that? It's like yeah, we're all for super strength, right? Yeah. 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 Maybe a bit more alert, just like whew, I'm alert. Oh, dude, I uh, I recently, uh, yes, uh, for reasons we'll discuss later. I uh, I recently discovered some of the limitations of of my my uh, senses, and I'm embarrassed. I'm aging, uh, and I'm falling be. apart. Yeah, uh, it's disgusting, Brian. Yeah. So you, we want to be alert, okay? And maybe maybe like 
you know, if you're Superman and you fly, you got to feel pretty good, right? You're like, I'm flying, right? Sure. Why yeah. not? Maybe maybe a little euphoria, you know, a little bit. Uh, yeah, sure. You're, you're really excited this, about it, man. Like, can, can I confess something? We took the kids to Six Flags, and there's a Superman ride uh, roller coaster. It's, it's you know, they license the Superman name, and they throw it on there, and they, they put a statue of Superman halfway it's through. It's not the Nietzsche the, the, Superman. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, oh, wow, that would be a different ride altogether, wouldn't it? <laughs> but but uh, uh, we went like three times over the course of the day, and one of those times I, I totally – because the you know the thing is is your feet dangle down. You're not really seated, seated in a coaster, but I totally pretended I was Superman. And uh, once you enter that, it's like it really felt like you were flying, and it was really fun. Is all the color drained from it, and there's no humorous moments? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wah, wah. burn. Sick so, uh, burn, so, Snyder. So you want to be you want to be euphoric, uh, you want to be like this. None of this brooding. Woo! I got superpowers, man. No, you want to be excited, right? Well, of course. Yeah. So we're all we're all go, right? Yeah. No, I'm in. I've already stepped inside the chamber. Justin and I are just like uh, just press the button right now, uh, Andrew. Don't worry about it. Well, the good yeah. news is, is you don't need a chamber, guys, to have this to have this this uh, this these powers. Um, and uh, you can vape it, uh, you can inject it, you can snort it, and it's natural. I want you to know this is natural. Uh, 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 are, are we talking okay. about... So what you're saying here is I can, I can roll down to my local vape shop and vape something for which gives me the power of five men? Is it legal? You know, I think Bruce Banner was probably doing experiments that were not quite legal. All right, now, well, now, let now, me wait, ask wait. you this. Is <laughs> it... Experiments aren't legal. <laughs> is it methamphetamine? a spaceship in Kansas is not legal. No, uh, real quick, when you're talking about... Uh, you're talking it about the... military grade equipment through Gotham is not legal. Now, now, when you're talking about the strength of five men, this isn't some illusion, right? This is... Star Ever filed for an FAA permit to fly? No, he no. didn't. He was super legal. He was extra legal. Uh, I, I, when you say the strength of five men, like that's that's a measured fact. We're not like self deluding ourselves. It's not like we had a dream that we were real strong or something. No, I mean, and again, I mean, when we say the strength of five men, I mean, it might mean like five cops tried to hold you down. <laughs> You're just too strong for them. Yeah, you know, so. So you could do that 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 spot that they do in wrestling where the really big guy like nine people like gather around him and then they like throw him off and everybody falls down like that's that's what we're kind of looking at in terms of the strength of five men. Yeah, as they start to tase you and try to cuff you. Yes, okay. but you're just is like unstoppable. Just meth? I mean, is it just? I mean, like, and, and if it's not, what's the difference between this and meth? It's not meth. And and let's be honest, meth meth people aren't known for like superhuman strength, like angel dust or something. I mean, but, but I mean they do have the power of like really clean rooms, like just fastidious as hell. Unbelievable. Yeah. Teeth not so much. That, I mean, but but uh, I'll tell you what, man, there's a uh, zero unpopped zits on uh on on meth heads. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So let me read uh, you this description. This is from Forbes, all right? I mean, this is, yeah. this is, and this is uh, by a medical doctor. Well, it's MD after his name, unless his parents gave him a really weird, you know, last name. Okay. A man rushes out of his house in Miami last month, ripping his clothes off in a rage, screaming violently after smoking a crystal like drug. Forget <laughs> that part, okay? Five police officers are required to take him down as he exhibits superhuman strength. He's sweating, paranoid, delusional and hallucinating about seeing objects in front of him. Or was he seen into another dimension? Let's be honest here, maybe... I mean, we're open-minded on this podcast, right? We don't judge. I mean, who are we to say they're not, you know, witnessing things that we would never be able to grok with our Imagine mortal... Imagine these reports around minds. Dr. Strange's house. Yeah, right? I bet I bet they call him a meth head. Yeah, crazy I mean, other synthetic stuff. Synthetic <laughs> chemicals and, and arcane uh, 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 symbols <laughs> abound. I would just I, I love the the for, the for the new Doctor Strange movie with Benedict Cumberbatch. There's there's just this reoccurring gag where he's getting defensive about not being a meth head. Like, <laughs> and I don't smoke meth. <laughs> the behavior described above, known as excited delirium, that sounds good. Excited delirium. How was a party last night? I mean, it's night, better guys? than the bored as hell delirium. The... Yeah. 
I mean, you could be, I could be a kindergarten teacher and describe how I was excited delirium. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. Dude, described as excited delirium is the result of emerging use of a new synthetic amphetamine like stimulant that is similar to the compound contained in bath salts, also known as cathinones. The drug is called Flocka. And if you are the parent of a teen, it's important to educate yourself about this new designer drug. All right. All right. I mean, so, uh, at what point? Okay, as 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 drug makers get squirrelier and squirrelier, figuring out how to adulterate or p- pull in more and more chemicals to to be within the legal confines of the law. Like at some point, don't you just turn to your kid and be like, just just do whatever, just do natural, real drugs. I mean, it's like don't 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 you know snort vhs tape what are, cleaner what whatever. are natural real drugs like heroin <laughs> yeah like, dude yes just please anything but i mean it's like you're chasing i don't know this the uh like legal xy uh, synthetic xy or whatever that stuff terrifies the hell out of me and it's like if, if my kids are uh, he says very quietly in case they're outside inside of your shot <laughs> <shop. laughs> i mean i don't know that all i'm saying is that's complicated i'd hate to have three girls right about now yeah. Uh, well, wait. Uh, it feels like you were going down the path of I would rather them do uh, like simpler drugs. <laughs> like that's that's the bargain you want to make. Is... I mean, uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't say that on a reported co- uh, on a recorded podcast going out to tens of thousands of people all over the world. Yeah. But I could, like, theoretically, <laughs> if I were Brian Brushwood living in Austin, Texas with three daughters, I could say, I'd prefer that you did drugs with a safer track record. Ugh, wow, so that's me, something you said. Definitely you said that. Let me continue. Yep. So uh, the <laughs> Flaca, uh, which is actually produced in the Middle East and Somalia, which, if you've ever seen Somali privates, pri- pirates, doesn't look like they're using it. But. <laughs> So uh, it comes from there, and uh, you know, of course, now they're making the synthetics, and you know, they're like, you know, there's there there are some side effects. Oh, jeez. Um, are, are we body about to? Are we about to rapidly elevate to highs 105 to 106 degrees, triggering a cascade of events, which could also lead to kidney damage, failures, or a result of rabid Um Breakdown. That's where the muscle begins to break down, release a chemical called CPK, uh, which causes kidney damage. The physiological effects trigger severe anxiety, paranoia, delusions, go to a psychotic state characterized by a surge of violence associated with increased strength and a loss of awareness <laughs> of reality. Yeah, I'm sure there are side effects of being blasted by gamma radiation too, man. Yeah, you know? so uh, our hometown, Justin, Fort Auto Police Department, according to the Sun Sentinel, is creating a specialized force loosely known as the FLACA Initiative to work with local agencies, the DEA, F, uh, ATF, and uh others to pursue this so dude um, this i mean i don't want to i don't want to step into this quagmire but all i could think of in my mind is this sounds an awful lot like those horrific horrific images of crocodile like you can't unsee that decayed flesh tissue and you can't unwrap your mind around you guys have seen that right yeah oh yeah that's that's so uh They've decided to create a website to educate people about the warning signs of this. Yeah. <laughs> Are the warning signs the strength of five men? Yeah, I mean, the potential effects and all that. It's, uh, they, they list it here at don'tbeaguineapig.com, which goes so, straight to a GoDaddy holding page. Well, okay. Are, 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 <laughs> Is, is 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 their point that it's experimental? I mean, are they kind of saying what I'm saying, which is like stick to the tried and true known safer drugs? Well, no, well, I mean, but this is not new. I mean, like there are certainly probably more pervasive uh, in today's day and age. But but designer drugs, I remember being a thing when I was in high school, oh, so many years ago. The the idea that you know you want that there are like oh these. Hip new thing, this hip new thing called ecstasy. You need to be aware of. And I <laughs> well, remember the part dragon. of the part of the goal of synthetic drugs is one is you're you're trying to one circumvent detection methods. You're trying to circumvent you know restrictions on certain ingredients, and so you're trying to do that. And you know, 
like anything else. It's like every year we get a new iPhone. We get a new version of, of Android. <laughs> you know, this year's exactly. new designer drug. You know, walking down the catwalk. <laughs> Flaka. <laughs> so so you know, exactly. He's got the strength of five men. <laughs> Ah, uh, you know, and, and and the reviewers are like really disappointed. They were hoping for the strength of six men. You yeah. know, it's really more of an incremental upgrade than it is a revolutionary uh, one. I, the diminishment of auditory hallucinations was good. I'm for yeah. that. I like that. So and what what happens? Uh, I, I, I want to couch a real life decision that I made in my life um, with a fictional decision. The fictional decision is what happens if somebody creates legitimately the perfect drug like across the board. You you live ten percent longer. You see ten percent better. You uh, you feel ten percent. We'll say thirty percent more euphoric, and uh, you know all all these things. And there there really is legitimately, as far as medical science knows, no downside or side effect. Or let's say they're marginal side effects, like you know. So we're talking about alcohol. Go ahead. Uh, well, well, and actually, what I was thinking of, as far as the real life analog, is caffeine because, uh, or or because in caffeine. There's articles that say, you know, it's like on the one hand, you definitely are more productive under caffeine. Mm -hmm. And as a lifestyle choice, you will get more done and you will uh, you will derive a socioeconomic benefit from deciding to do caffeine. Now, I gave up caffeine for for uh, two years and I noticed that I had put on like two or three pounds. I was thicker in the neck and I was I was just um uh, the the upside of it was when I performed. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Oh, now all I can imagine is Brian wrapping a little tape measure around his neck and just you like, just you just see like, at the pinch mark and saying, "Oh." <laughs> I mean, you could tell from the photos and stuff, but like the the upside was when I performed magic. Even if I was nervous, I very rarely got the trembly fingers. Uh, but then at some point, I decided to start doing caffeine again. I was I was just like, I don't like how thick I am. I don't like my lack of energy. I don't like how down I am. And so I started it up again. And it made me think that caffeine is one of the few drugs that universally has a downside. There's a definite downside to caffeine. There are physiological problems with, with deciding to do it. And yet, as a society, we're cool with it. In ways that were obviously not cool well, with with this new one. Well, it's like it's like you know the amount of the degree of effect and the amount of moderation. I, I just went a week and a, like a week and a half without caffeine. It's like oh, let me see if I can do this. I didn't went, go through any withdrawal. I wasn't there like oh, I gotta have it. Uh, you know, I was like end of the week. I'm like yeah, I miss it. I miss the taste of my diet coke and went back to it. But I you know I just said oh, okay, I can get I can walk I can walk away anytime, guys. And <laughs> and I I limit my caffeine intake you know to earlier in the day now. I don't have it later at night. Um, you know, so I think that, yeah, there's every certain things work well in degrees, other things not so much. And, and that becomes, you can only consume so much caffeine before consuming more caffeine is really painful and you don't want to consume it. And that's one of the, it's self inhibiting in that way. Well, sure. So I guess my question is in, in, in the, uh, theoretical discussion about designer drugs, like, do you think that in our lifetime, we're going to see, there's kind of like this big six, right? You got what you got nicotine caffeine, uh, marijuana, alcohol, uh, cocaine, and heroin, right? Netflix. Those are those are the big guys. Yeah, and then Netflix, too, yeah. And then Netflix, right? Uh, are we going to see a new entry into into the, that category, and will it be legal or illegal in our lifetime? I, I mean, I guess it depends. Oh, psychedelics, they say in the chat. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think that another, a big area, the biggest, the, the thing that we need the most, the thing that we need the most to combat is we do need something that helps with obesity. We need something that helps, that speeds up metabolisms or helps people in a, in a way that will not uh, be too destructive, but the biggest, that is, that is one of the biggest consistent problems we have is that we are, we're not designed for this environment of having this much available food and calories. We solved food. We solved the most critical, important problem of survival readily to where people in the lowest income level have the biggest problem, not in calorie consumption and undercount consumption, but overconsumption. And we could get into debate about quality or whatever and availability, which is just food, food deserts are a myth, relatively speaking. And given choices, people make bad choices. So, um, what if there's it, a drug called temperance that it's like you took it and it's like you're like that's enough that's enough quarter of chat I only ate half my quarter pounder I just well they do no know. they do have it that's one of the things they have for like if you're trying to like they have like appetite suppressants are are a thing and I think that you know where you want to find something that probably the best thing you can do is you can look at somebody who has biologically 
is has you know has a has a has a well metabolism like like I know a girl who's you know she's super half fast metabolism she weighs 95 pounds she can eat as much as I do and she looks great but she's also going to burn it off whatever whatever you can do to get that metabolism and give it to somebody else and we can talk all in all we can talk as much as one oh it's willpower like willpower is a real thing but if your biology is pushing you one way it takes a lot more willpower to get you that other way no and that yeah. definitely i mean i you know uh, uh, it's been we've been playing this game for 5 years and i can definitely Look at myself five years ago and be all like, my metabolism's not the same as five years ago. Yeah, yeah, and and, and, and people are born with different ones, and that's that's a thing that is it's 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 frustrating because you know I have friends who are very fit and athletic, and I look at people who are not, and like Ugh. I'm like, listen, I think willpower is real. Like you make a choice. I, every time I snap into a slim gym, every time I put a red vine into my mouth, I am making a choice. I am a sentient human being making a choice. For some people, that ability it's a lot easier for them to say nah than others and how we get to there I think is going to be a very interesting area in you know drug research so wait so the, if you were to say that there is one there's one uh, field in that list that Brian named like that would be what the, I, the, the, the goal of, of something like that I think he's right appetite suppressants now are are usually like methamphetamine based right like is yeah, that I don't the mean an appetite thing? suppressant that was that was that, right. that's that's it, it could be well it sounded to me if i'm understanding you right uh andrew you would include uh you know metabolism altering drugs or you know like yeah you know, and, we and hear the about chat brown point, fat we'll point out microbiome transplants and, and you know the, the bacteria in your stomach can affect a lot about in the in your body can affect a lot about your diet and it might not be a once it might be a multi-part solution but i think and it might be genetic and i but i think that that is if you're going to say what's going to be the accepted thing i think it's going to be the thing that's going to one make one you want to increase your ability your willingness to be more active too because it's not just a matter of keeping calories off it's exercise and it's getting out and it's doing stuff and helping people you know how who are people who have these you know uh, better lifestyles and again it's so much of it you meet people who are professional fitness trainers and they're all the same, the ones. They were all the same people in high school. They were all the same all along. They were the people doing track. They were doing all these different sports year-round. These were people who were like that, and they go and try and teach us how to be like this. And it's like but, it's but, like the person but, naturally gifted at math. Well, but no, no, no. And, and more importantly, it's like the reason they're like that is because they love it. They get a yeah. genuine high out of being physically active. And it's like they feel bad if they're not dropping and doing a push-up every five minutes or whatever. So it's like, like it's it's not comparable if, 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 if you're somebody who doesn't love that activity. Yeah, if you put me in a room with a blank sheet of paper and a pen and let me spend five hours writing down ideas, love it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> other know? people, that's prison. Literally yeah, prison. Exactly. So I think uh, that's going to be the, the idea is to we, – we, we find these little hacks and ways to try to do stuff and we find ways like, oh, well, you know, we can give you steroids which will cause this, whatever. But, you know, as you know – it's like, you know, Brian and I, like we both know like we can put on muscle but we don't keep muscle the same way guys who are very naturally muscle bound are. And, and it's just – it's a different kind of thing. Like, you know, the, the, the Timothy Ferris book, like the, the four-hour, you know, diet, whatever, for our, you know, the – Sure. The, what, you know, he in there, he's like, here's how to put, I did like his version of that, like eating steak and all this stuff. And I put on like, you know, 20 pounds of muscle and what got big. And it was a hell of a lot of work for me to stay that way. You know, once I stopped eating like that, I could keep working out, but shrink. So one of the things I like about your suggestion that this is the realm where we'll uh, accept a new a big drug is because uh, right now, the, what, the number one health threat is obesity. So it's like the problem with drugs in general is that there's always a trade-off, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's a trade-off in productivity, whether it's a trade-off in the perception of free will, whether it's a trade-off of you know class warfare or whatever, um, that's what makes society uncomfortable with it. But with obesity being such a number one thing, if it's a thing... And by the way, it's it's fascinating to to know that essentially diet pills of of two three decades ago really were just meth when it was legal, and people were like, oh well, let's just do a little meth and do a little housework and pop a little zits, <laughs> uh, and then um, it, you know, and then it, at any rate, I do think that a metabolism altering chemical would be acceptable to society. As here's the question. I would say as certainly acceptable as long as it doesn't feel good. But what mm. if there was like a strong euphoria that came with it? Is there some kind of society 
shame that we have with that that that, that people would shut oh, it down. No, I, I think that would be necessary, if, especially if it came with a lifestyle change component, and and you had to be slightly more active than you were otherwise. Like it it has to come with its own. I'm happy about this sort of reward. The the biggest, the big test would be if there is a huge bill to be paid. I think you would be, it would be fine if it makes you happy. It's obviously going to be incredibly successful and, and world changing if it works. Uh, but if, you know, and, and with those two things ticked off, it buys itself X amount of like, all right, well, also every once in a while, you have a hard time getting to sleep or something like that. Like, okay, I could see that being a trade off. But if it's like, you break out in hives or you grow a horn, like obviously you're not going to do it. <laughs> so you think there does need to be a, uh, a, a downside in order for society no, to no, accept No, no, no. I think that, that that's, that's uh, like, I feel like we could, you know, and maybe I'm just inventing this and, you know, but like th there are drugs that could do the upside of what we're talking about in research or, you know, uh, you know, that's on the radar of medical science now. I'll bet you that the problem is there's just the downsides are too hard. You know, they're 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 not something that either would pass FDA regulations or that would be commercially viable. You know, there's there's another side. Uh, real quick, just to speculate wildly, I, I um, you know, if if we're talking about drugs, where there's a lot of preconceived notions in Western society about various drugs, but it seems to me like you could engineer a class of food that uh, you know was uh, felt super fatty, or I guess we already have that. You know, you got the Alestra and all that kind of crap. But yeah, there there's been a lot of approaches. You know, one of the biggest things that's helped a lot in some cases is is gastric bypass surgery because you have people who get so used to consuming so much food it is hard for them to feel full and and uh, and you know the idea that that can help some people and then but the problem is is that like any other when food's an addiction when you're trying to do it to fill some other thing or time it it can help but then you can fall back into your habits and it can get very very worse but i've seen several people who've had really 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 good results you know with the gastric bypass surgery and it helps to an extent it doesn't make them super skinny because they still have to deal with these other you know, compulsions towards food and, and the way they handle calories. But we see these, we see improvements. You know, LASIK is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, I had LASIK years ago and my vision is still fantastic. It's 2020. And, you know, we get in, you hear the argument, oh, they never, they don't, they want to cure anything. I'm like, well, you know, the eyeglass industry, let this one slip by. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, so. Since we're talking about superpowers and we're talking about ways to experience superpowers, can I suggest a topic for you guys? No, Brian. Uh, sure. What about we talked about, you know, you uh, with the drug, you feel like you have the strength of five men because you can fight off five police officers. <laughs> you feel invincible because you're high. You feel euphoric. Uh, did you read this week's uh, article about inducing the feeling of being truly invisible? Did you see this? Oh, I'm so excited. You guys I didn't saw the headline. I did not read it. Okay. So you know the experiment where they set up, uh, they, they, they make you feel like a mannequin arm is your arm by setting yeah. up a, a, a mirror. And then they, they brush your hand as they brush yeah. the mannequin arm. And after a while, you, your brain, you know, smooths out the wrinkles and what it's seeing. And it says, oh, that must be your arm. And then they smash it with a hammer and you have this big disconnect or whatever. Uh, uh, what the, using oculus vr stuff i'll go ahead and show you the article they uh they set up a mannequin body and they uh they do the same thing they they stroke your belly with a brush and they stroke the belly of the mannequin at the same time <laughs> so you're wearing this oculus looking down and there you what you're seeing is the body of the mannequin being brushed but at the same time you feel your belly being brushed and so you you know after a while will smooth out the wrinkles and decide that, that you're 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 feeling it and uh, and then after a while they remove the mannequin but they continue to brush air so you look down and because you're seeing things through the mannequin's point of view uh, which is now just a, a, a helmet suspended yeah. over nothing they're brushing air but you feel it on your belly and then they then of course because they're they're evil psychiatrists uh, they, they pull out a knife and stab air and freak you out <laughs> this is one step below like jigsaw in saw <laughs> like this is terrible <laughs>
<laughs> this is not something that we should be rewarding. <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 this is fascinating to me because it makes me wonder how much, how much we really want superpowers. For, for the three of us, we grew up reading comics and we really wanted to be superheroes. But, but as simulations get better and better, like 90, 95%, 98, 99% of what we want to get out of having superpowers People are going to be able to have a takeaway through through these simulations. I guess it depends on why you wanted superpowers. My reasons were different. <laughs> now, yeah, my 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 reasons were just to feel it. Your reasons were to actually do good for society. Uh, yeah, oh. <laughs> do good, no. Brian. No, those were not Andrew's reasons. <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> and, and Andrew wants superpowers for the same reason that he wants. Uh, you know, heavy duty equipment, you know, like it's just it is it is a utility and a means to an end. All I'm saying is I think William Fisk would make a great mayor of New York and potentially a candidate in 2016 for president. Uh, Wilson Fisk. Yeah, Wilson no, sure. Fisk. I, I buy it. He seems real sensitive. He seems like a he real cares. down to earth guy. Very much. Who, who do you think has a better shot of winning uh, if they were both legitimate candidates? Chris Christie or the Kingpin? Oh, dude. I mean, uh, kind of look uh, one of the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually i hadn't really seen that parallel until just now uh so yeah uh, no i think you know superpowers are cool until everybody else gets them and it's like great <laughs> you know <laughs> like right now so i i got i don't know if you know oh what time is it oh it's apple watch time so hey, uh, can, can we real quick um uh please tell us because uh both justin and i are on the apple watch hype train we're both oh, getting let's see them. your watches let me see your watches guys uh, I, I got, I got an old I hate you crappy pebble look at oh, that it's not, it's not. Yeah. oh hold on oh. wait a minute uh my microphone is hiding yeah <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, i got i was told that i was gonna get uh my uh watch like like may or whatever late may i think justin had an earlier estimated delivery date than i did no so, mine was mine's like the first week of june was the oh yeah um because you went and ordered the space gray and everybody yeah. did that because only drug dealers buy the white band and, uh, and hookers. It's called China White. There's a reason they named the band that color. Yeah. So uh, I order it, and then I got that late. I'm like, well, you know, that'll be a nice May thing to do. And then I got the update, like, hey, your Apple Watch is going to be delivered Friday. Oh. Uh. So, so. We, we, before we went live, we talked about the different reasons that people are getting into the Apple Watch. And for me, you know, the, the Pebble has been a known quantity, and I absolutely adore it for the, the, the tracking and for the, you know, getting messages and stuff. That's what I love about it. And, and you were mentioning that other people, for them, it's the fitness that's going to do it. What, what is it that, that made you, that gave you Apple Watch fever? Um, the hope that I would get it before Justin and I could rub it in his face. Oh, God, I hate you. Oh, <laughs> God. God, it's the worst. So so the thing that, like, you know, watching the demo, and we talked, you know, Brian, make, you made a very good point that unlike other Apple products, it's not like there's this clear, I mean, I would say that iPod was obviously music. Right. It was, it, it, they, was they had a very clear statement, a thousand songs <laughs> in your pocket, right? Because it could do. Yeah. You know, one thing. Correct. And, and and then and then the iPhone was like, hey, phone, internet, internet communicator, best yeah. iPod ever. You know, and then we get you get iPad was iPad was where it got a little bit. People were like, what's the why would I use that instead of a laptop? That was a hazy thing for people. And that was there was a, there was an argument that iPad needed a clear case study where I looked at it originally and I wanted a better Kindle. You know, I wanted a better Kindle that I could surf the web on. And instead, I got this magical gateway into a whole other wonderful universe. But it, it's I use mine differently than other people. But that got into that sort of because it does so many more things, that's where it starts to get kind of nebulous. And it's kind of like somebody saying, why should I buy a computer? And you're like, <laughs> yeah, I, if, if I have to tell you why I buy it, it may not work for you. And then so with this, and I, I see the Apple Watch being good, by the way, for Pebble, because I think that some people might be like, you know what? I like this. I like this. I don't need this other stuff. And I love the idea that Pebble will last seven days. You know, I don't. And I think that it's I think it's going to be a I think Apple Watch will probably be very much the clear cut biggest single seller of it. But I think that we're going to see a lot of other competing devices in there are doing their following their own pathways. And I think it's a great thing. 
Yeah, actually, uh, uh, I, I'm getting both the Apple Watch and I've already pledged for the Pebble Time Steel, and we'll wait until I get both. But my theory is I actually got the fancier band for the Pebble Time Steel because of the seven-day battery life. And because mm -hmm. I, right now, my current Pebble, I pretty much uh, only enjoy the benefits of the alerts coming up. So if that's what I'm going to do, I figure that'll be my day-to-day, -day, work week, nicer-looking watch that goes with a, a dress shirt or whatever. And then the, uh, the Apple Watch, because of its specific fitness tracking ability, that's going to be my gym watch that uh, that I wear uh, to you know to 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 get specific details on you know my swim workout and of course I got I got triathlon fever right now. But at the same time, the the difference with the watch in where it is very much more like the iPad than it is the the iPhone or the iPod is that it's it's a very personal device. Like the the idea of a watch is a very personal thing. So I think there would be a danger. And there has been, if you just look at the sales data, on single-use, very understandable fitness trackers or, you know, watches and stuff like that that just kind of tell time. You know, beyond what uh, you would see, you know, for like big high-end fashion watches, there's a reason why they've kind of fallen out of favor as just a general, let me tell the time, utility. It's I'm and I've said this before. The thing that excites me the most about it is is you know there are already three thousand apps on it. And I started playing around with different stuff, and there are things that I like. There are things that I like on my phone that I actually like better on my Apple Watch. Uh, one of the things I love is is an app called Numerous, which is great for tracking things. <clears throat> so I can pull that up, and. I can pull up, let's say, you know, when's the next SpaceX launch? You know, when's these things? And so having those things just right on my watch are really cool. The idea of like, you know, having my directions on the the watch, oh, here, uh, let me full you know, pull up you. the maps, and and just to have that, the calendar, you know, just the the quick, hey, you know, here's the calendar, here's what's going on, you know, my my everything I have to do. Those things are nice. You know, looking up, they do New York Times and L.A. Times has their little stock. Or excuse me, they're little one sentence headlines. You know, Instagram is fun on it because it's just let me do a really quick thing. Let me not just dive really deeply into it, and I can see what's going on. So the idea of taking, you know, what was you know Google Now and Apple Glances and those things and putting into that format for there is useful. There's you know the games they're coming out with that are very interesting too because you get it in the idea of you know they have one you know, several of these interactive kind of games where. You know, something pops up and it's like you're interacting with somebody who says they're a spy and you send them on missions and hours later you come back with something else you have to tell them or whatever. Um, there's a lot of that little like just the micro attention sort of like, oh, that's cool. I, I, the thing that I really want is to have a, uh, I'd love to have like a little comics XKCD and stuff. That's the thing I'm looking forward to is just an app that I can just pull up. Oh, that's funny. You know, or like at a, a particular time every day, it's like, it's 10 o'clock. Here's the three panel comic from X, Y, or mm -hmm. Z that you get. And you just swipe, swipe, swipe. You're like, Oh, momentary amusement. That's great. Yeah. But I, I think, think what, like what we're, what, what's really interesting. And, and, uh, you know, Andy and Otko, uh, made a point that, you know, like uh, today and over the weekend, there's going to be, you know, the, the loud, breeze that you'll feel is the exhale from developers who developed these uh, apps on the emulator that now see them on a regular watch and kind of have to start from scratch. Uh, it, this is a really, a really interesting development challenge because unlike the other devices, including the iPad, we have never had more or more sophisticated mobile apps for big screens, small screens. And so now the idea of not only figuring out whatever the learning curve of how people want to interact with these watches and kind of getting past that initial wave of like, oh, okay, well, we can do these things, but is it fun? Is it interesting? Is it something that people really want to do and you'll find a rewarding experience from? And then also figuring out, okay, we have a litany, a treasure trove of apps that people absolutely love. How do we figure out where people want to interact with that data in that smaller screen size? And like this next three months is going to be amazingly experimental and fascinating. So my favorite so far, Yelp. I open up Yelp and all of a sudden Yelp comes up with, it's a very simple, uh, shows me, you got the, oh, I can't see, I know. It's, uh, there we go. We, yeah, we see things. it. So there, there, there's four quadrants on your, the on upper your. Upper left is restaurants. I press restaurants. And so 
it already it's already figuring out well i'm just going to use where you're at i'm just going to do this stuff i'm not going to ask you the same stuff i would on on android or on ios it's just like i'm just going to go straight to you know what restaurants are near you and so immediately it just pulls up the closest restaurant so there's one 300 feet away from me and so it's a streamline if you're using this on your watch we have a pretty good idea exactly what you want to do same with uber and i love the idea of we're now <coughs> oh, that's a muted <coughs> that's <laughs> sorry <I'm over> <laughs> Dude, uh, you and me both. I've had a uh, if video watchers have been watching me suddenly go silent as I cough repeatedly. Uh, that's a, it's a difficult thing. Sorry, you were saying about Uber. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's that you know it's just that figure out like exactly if you're an app can be a button. What happens when you press that button? So if you're Yelp and you have a button, you press this button. What happens? We tell you restaurants near you, and you can do other. You can within that the uh, the Apple Watch, you can do other things. But with Uber, you press that Uber button. You probably want an Uber, and we're going to say, okay, here's Uber. If you want one, here's how far away it is. Press it now to get it. That's the weird. That's the weird. Uh, yeah, and I, on your recommendation, I just finished. You know, becoming Steve Jobs, and one of the lessons from that book is that he figured out. You know, his greatest contribution to technology is that less can be more. Is that uh, mm -hmm. that that throwing everything that you can do isn't necessarily always a good good idea and the idea that you know yelp as an institution of course uh, on on a pc it's a place for you to talk and give reviews it's a place for you to interact it's a place for you to resolve disputes on your iphone is a place for you to analyze all of that stuff but on your wrist it's just a single button that says i'm hungry give me a place good enough right now that's uh, open brilliant. now and, and and that's that's what you know yelp i when i look at my use case for yelp it really could be three buttons. You know, mm -hmm. it might be a better experience for me with the three buttons that I normally hit whenever I'm in a strange city, which I find myself in very often. So uh, it's, it, it, it is amazing to see like how fast I think, and that's part of Apple's bet really, is that, you know, this becomes something magic on your wrist development wise you know, just in terms of the app, very quickly, as it has so much more of a head start than the iPhone or even the iPad did. Well, and, and partly we are a trained populace in that we, this is a familiar echo of a dance that we've played, you know, three or four times. You know, certainly every generation of a new iPhone happens. But even, you know, these revolutionary changes, uh, I mean, you, you're talking about the white hot electricity happening right now for developers. On the same side, there's an expectation like because we've all gone through this revolution before as consumers, we're expecting everything to get resolved. We're like, yeah, no, give it 20 minutes. I'm sure there'll be an app that does this thing that I you're wanting right now so i press one button yeah and i press it's open yeah skittles <laughs> for audio listeners uh andrew pressed his futuristic wristwatch and shouted skittles and now boys and girls wait children of all ages i want to see an actual rainbow come out of your freaking wrist Oh, 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 oh. Wait, can, uh, can we you... are now focusing. Oh. Can can you buy Skittles from that? Is that what's happening? I that it's hard to see, I know. Oh uh, I, well, you have the webcam in your mouth. <laughs> uh Andrew now <laughs> Jeez, is... That's the Amazon Prime app. I have not turned on purchasing, but if purchasing is turned on, I'd press one button and then all of a sudden I would one click buy Skittles from can, Amazon Prime to be delivered to me. So that's amazing. All right, so can we can we side jag into a, a situation that happened? Uh, the, the Radio Shack close to our local HEB closed. And uh, as they do when things close, they just want to get their money back on everything. So they do 40 to 60% off of everything. So I walked in and it was fairly, there was still still a lot of stuff. I could tell that the, the Primo stuff was cleaned out that morning. And there definitely was one uh, guy with a, with a plastic bag just opening up individual uh, uh, shelves of resistors and just scooping them all in, buying everything. But, uh, but you know, here in the studio, we've got like, you know, mic cables and microphones and, and, yeah. and mic stands or whatever. And I'm like 60% off. Surely that's competitive with online prices. I could buy some stuff and then, uh, and then I don't have to worry about it for later. Let me just impulse buy it right now. 
every single item, not one item in that 60% off wonderland of a store closing, not one item was even close to its online price. Yeah, the, the, the problem with that is you're really not buying it from Radio Shack looking to just make whatever they have off inventory. They sell their entire inventory to liquidation companies that really don't care whether like they they attract people who are, look at liquidation sale and say, oh, my God, I can go buy a bunch of really cheap stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's cheaper than it was right. uh, the day before that the liquidation sale came in. But it's like like you said, you know, especially in a world of Amazon Prime, if you're willing to wait 12 to 48 hours, uh, you can pretty much have everything that you would uh, otherwise buy for cheaper than uh, at a liquidation sale. You know Two things were interesting. I took a class on like marketing and business, and they explained basically how closeouts work and like how like an department store, you have your item and then you have it worth your first. You know, it's on the shelf for six weeks. It doesn't sell, then you take ten percent off for a week. It doesn't move, then you do twenty percent, and then you do thirty percent, and finally you move it over to some point. And then if it doesn't even move there, you either throw it away or it goes off to someplace else. But the whole idea of the time sort of, some people will buy it at this point. Some people will buy it here. Some people are like, never going to buy it. It's never going to sell. And, and it's, it's, that's how retail works. And, you know, you go to a Radio Shack and you look at how the costs are so much higher than Amazon, you realize, well, this is the price of rent. This is the price yeah. of having five people in one store that's going to have 30 visitors today. This is the, you know, two people working there. This, these are all the costs that you're paying for. And when you hear people talk about, well, Amazon's going to open stores, they're going to do something, but they're not going to open up stores because, no. you know, are expensive. There's a reason why stores are closing. And, and there's certainly cases where special things, we have high enough margins, it makes it worthwhile. But it's not going to be worth, you know, sell you Amazon Basics ain't going to work it. Yeah, I wonder, uh, I, is, that a, is that a bad thing or a good thing? You know, in the short term, it, there's the known effect that you can see. You can point to the jobs lost. You can point to the entrepreneurs who, you know, bought franchises for Radio Shack and say like, ah, this is really rough or whatever. But it's, but what, sell me on, I mean, do you think much about like the unseen benefits of that stuff? I, I think that I think that they sometimes there are, and then you sometimes will find yourself in a position where you know you're like you know what we do need to have stores for certain things, or we do want this. And you know I using the Apple ecosystem is a great example of where Apple products they produce it in enough volume that that can you know competitively you know people are like like oh it's more expensive. I'm like I don't know when you look at the build quality. You're to find something the comparable build quality, it's going to cost around the same sort of price, and so and there used to be there used to be more of a premium on that, but part of but Apple makes these big huge profits, but part of what they do is, you buy an iPhone, you get to go into an Apple store and say I don't know how to work this, and they can pay for somebody there to do that. I can't get that with a Google product. Correct. You know you know Google only makes fifteen bucks a year off of you. If you call if you call somebody up on phone support and talk to them for thirty minutes, they've lost money on you. Correct. Well, and and also you know, and this has been my experience. I'm sure somebody has a counter example, but in my experience, uh, you know, I get three words into the sentence, my headphones don't seem to, and they've already handed me a replacement hair, yeah. a pair of headphones. You know, and I, and I think that you look at you know, like I I try to buy from local magic shops when I need a magic item, and and the problem I have with local magic shops is I'll go in there and I go, hey, what about this they go I don't know anything about it okay now this is why I would go online to buy this because you you I can if I'm on I to find out about it I'm gonna have to go sit in front of my computer go to one of these magic forums and I'll read about it I'm not gonna go back out to the magic shop to go buy this and when you don't have that knowledge in store when you don't know these things a really good knowledgeable person, a really good salesperson could do this and then could help you and do that, and, and it gets to be a trade-off. And, well, that's the, and, I, and, and I suspect we're entering an age of consumer awareness where they could even flatly say, hey, if price is an issue, you could probably save 20% doing it online, but if you buy it right now, you know, here's my personal cell phone, my name's Gary, I'll yeah. take care of you for whatever. And people I'll would be like, yeah, I'm let's go. Yeah, and I'll pay. I, I'm always willing to walk into Magic Shop and pay. I'll pay. I can, listen. I can get the stuff for free if I just email people, you know. But I will. I will buy in a Magic Shop. I'll pay someone if they can tell me, you know, like, oh yeah, oh I played it with this. I did this or I talked. Like that's great. That I want to pay for that value. I'm willing to pay for that. But when you don't have that, and that applies to a lot of local things, you don't. And I think that that's, 
you know, sometimes you're always, and they're always going to run the risk in a magic shop. People are going to walk in there and go, oh, I can get it cheaper online. And it's like, well, yeah, but there are, a, you can create customers who you want to cultivate customers like myself who I will pay for your knowledge. I'll pay for your experience because I appreciate that. Yeah. Hey, uh, but that doesn't apply to everything. That's a problem with bookstores is, you know, you can't expect somebody who works at a bookstore to know every single one of those damn books and it's hard to compete with Amazon and pricing. Uh, agreed. And I, I, I suspect, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's really weird to see the uh, emerging world. Uh, there was a, um, oh, dude, I, I think it was on the You Are Not So Smart podcast. It was talking about the cognitive bias that happens when people search for answers to things in Wikipedia. It gives them a false sense of security of knowing how to do other stuff and apparently we are a dying breed in that we are part of a generation that remembers what it was like to want to know the answer to a thing and to know to 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 say i'm trying to find the answer to this to spend six hours looking for it and ultimately saying i can't find the answer i don't know this like that's apparently a thing that's just going away just oh. going yeah it's just not happening we get that all the time in debates where people are like, well, check this link out. Well, this person really summed this thing up. It's all meta, meta, meta. It's yep. all this. And and that that's and I've been guilty of that too. I've been like, oh no, so and so handled like my authority here handled this. Right. Like, no, I don't have any real knowledge, but this guy does, and maybe I don't really have any real knowledge to know if they're really an authority. And that gets to be so frustrating. Uh, and it's it's not it's not a way to have discourse. Saying I don't know is a wonderful thing. Um, and can I tell you what I've been doing the last few days? What? Um, enjoying Does it involve Apple. your wristwatch? <laughs> no, no. Uh, so I'm very, very lucky. I'm a member of the Magic Castle here in Los Angeles. And both Justin and Brian have been there and have uh, performed there. Uh, and it is – what's neat about the Magic Castle, it's this private club that has – it's right near Hollywood, right off of Hollywood Boulevard. It's up on the hillside. It looks like this you know, kind of Harry Potter-esque thing from the outside. It's this old mansion, historic mansion that's been fitted into a club where they have shows every single night, seven nights a week. They have, a show, they have several showrooms. And – you can get invited, you know, a member can give you, you know, can invite you to there, whatever. Anybody and, and by the that. way, it's legit. Like you could tell this thing's got so much history and so much weird stuff. I remember one of the most magical moments. They, they don't close off any parts of the building, uh, regardless of how, let's, let's say it's a light Monday night or something like that. I remember wandering down into the basement, you know, looking at all these unused showrooms where you could tell close up rooms would, you know, performances would be happening on a Friday night. And I heard a crowd around the corner and I remember walking around that corner and then hearing shh, 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 and then the crowd vanishing and I and I walked in and there's just nobody there and it's like that is a performance specifically for somebody snooping around on a slow night and it's the whole place is filled with adorable stuff yeah. like that one thing they have which I absolutely love is they've got a library uh, run by they've got two fantastic librarians there Lisa and Bill who, who look after this and they've got you know, people have donated books, thousands of thousands of books. There are thousands of books, and and you're not going to find a greater collection of magic books outside of probably David Copperfield's warehouse, you know, or yeah. some crazy collector somewhere. And it's all if you're if you're a member, I can go online, I can go look up, see what books are there, what videos there. Every instructional video they, by the way, they have every instructional magic DVD they have is actually available on computer. So you can sit down there and say, oh, I want to look up the history of the dancing handkerchief. And I can pull up every video where somebody's taught something on it. Or I can look for books, turn around and go through the stacks. And it's, it's you know, being in that environment and doing research is very different than sitting at home and doing it. And, and being at home and going doing research on YouTube is wonderful. But then you also, if it somebody didn't, if it's a video before 2005 and nobody uploaded it, you know, there's a world out there. And I was... I was doing his, look, research into a magic trick, and I found a thing that's attributed to one person, very, very heavily argumented, like, this guy did it, this guy did it, and then I found 10 years earlier a little pamphlet that describes this method, and like, oh, this is interesting, not to invalidate what this other person contributed to, but like, no, this thing existed before, and then I dig into that, and I'm like, oh, wow, there's a whole other history here, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah, it really and, is. If only every town had, like... I don't know something like that—a place you could go to, yeah. where you could just where, where there's like a collection of 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 information, materials, yeah, and maybe like a specialist who's like really good at helping you find yeah. the knowledge that you seek. Like you could walk Dare up, to dream, 
Yeah. <laughs> that would be pretty awesome. Hey, man, we're at uh, 52 minutes. You guys want to talk picks? Let's do picks. Uh, I got a pick. What is it? So we were uh, we talked all uh, last week, which, by the way, next week, I-, I know people have been sending in like crazy their UFO stories. And we have a we have we have a great doc that that Neshcom put together that we will definitely go through next week. Uh, to, uh, you know, because I think there's some great stuff in there. Hey, uh, I'm going you know week- to go straight to UFO country in Oregon next week for that. What? Oh, awesome. Uh, so we uh, talked a lot about Star Wars last week. Who did we? Uh, I, of course, said they came out on digital uh, a couple weeks before that. Downloaded Star Wars, uh, all, all three of them. Put uh, two of them on my phone. The other one is having a hard time downloading. I'm on my second go round of watching A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, just killing fl- like time on flights. Uh, Empire Strikes Back. Let me just let me just talk for a second. Uh, my picks. Empire Strikes Back. This is this is when. Uh... Both Andrew and I sort of uh, fade to the background, just clapping to the rhythm of the beat while you take your solo dance. I mean, here's what you need to know about Empire Strikes Back. It is Andrew tries to find a new pick. (laughs) Andrew is literally running around trying to find a new pick. Was that your pick? (laughs) That's why I keep going, Justin. You you got Uh, the spotlight. Ignore him. Uh, Here's the thing about Empire Strikes Back. It is... As a script, it's really weird. Like, it, it almost defined not only what is a good, what, what is an, an, an interesting script in terms of its storytelling-wise, but what is the perfect sequel? Like, it, it, by the end of it, you know, there are through lines, but the characters really don't have tremendous journeys. You know, they're not, they're, they're degrees different than they are at the beginning of the story, but it's not like it is in, in A New Hope where, you know, the scoundrel who shoots somebody in cold blood at the beginning risks his life and his business, you know, to save a kid he just met. Uh, or, you know, the the uh, the whiny farm boy, you know, becomes the hero of the universe. Uh, it, there's, there's degrees, and yet... It's so compelling. It's so amazing. And there are things that happen in that movie that I think we would laugh at in, in, in just if you if you took it out. You know, the fact that, like, you hear Obi-Wan Kenobi in, in you know, Force uh, VO. <laughs> the fact and, that he in, shows up as a translucent ghost waving his hand. he shows up as Exposition the Ghost. So it was just like, you need to go somewhere in the second act, Luke. And <laughs> right? he's like, oh, my God, okay. And there, he's like, all there, right, see you later. That's amazing because you're right. There's zero irony in uh, in in The Empire Strikes Back. Everything what? is present. Burning Bush is talking to me. I know. It's but cool, like take me seriously. <laughs> But it's so amazing, like the storytelling and and the art in how they do stuff. I mean, that script, every every scene has a cliffhanger. Every scene has a thing that moves you on to the next one that like it has such a propulsion that you don't even realize unless you watch it three times on an airplane, (laughs) uh, you know, that like. Oh my God! It, it, there's there's so little linear sense to like. Oh, we're on a snow planet now. We're getting chased by a space worm, and now we're in. We're introducing these characters, and like with thirty minutes left in the movie, that we're going to have play these major roles, and like the like the Lando character, the the real estate he gets to have us care about him, betray our main characters, and then spoiler alert. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry, and then. Uh, you know, res- redeem himself at the end is minuscule. He has so little time to do it, and yet by the end, when when you know he's uh, when when Chewie's got his hands around his neck and and he's like like no no we can do this and like you know we can try and save uh, Han. You're like oh oh that's great. He isn't just a, a, a piece of crap opportunist. Like he does care about his friend. It's so well done. It, it is. It is exceptional. It's my pick. Well, and it's funny. Uh, and of course, you and I, uh, all three of us, are inextricably linked to our childhoods with the action figures. And in, if I'm writing a movie, a scene where they just parade out a line of bounty hunters just for the privilege of saying no disintegrations so that they could sell toys later, I'd be like, no, that's dumb. Don't do that. That doesn't advance the plot. You're just selling toys. I hate everything about this idea in theory. And yet, that eight-second chunk is like one of my favorite parts of all of Empire because I'm like, IG-88, Bosk. You know, it's like I just, I know all of them. Yeah, exactly, Dengar, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, you're so right. It's like it, 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 I, I would say it would never get made today, and yet, fingers crossed. You know this. I'm, this I'm gonna Christmas. defend the bounty hunter scene too, though, because what what my pick? I'm gonna get to my pick now. My pick is Star Wars, and I do call it Star Wars, not A New Hope, because it was originally released as Star Wars and not Episode Four. By That's the way, right. The but, opening crawl did not say Episode yeah, Four, A New it, Hope. It gets lost down the memory hole that the first revision was. We'll call it. I'm gonna call it Episode Four now. Anyhow, regardless, Star Wars, New Hope. Okay. By, by, by the way, if, we, if we're given Star Wars picks, my picks is is the original trailers for the original Star Wars. Just yeah. how weird that crap was. Brian, I'm doing my pick right sorry, now. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, one of the things I love about, and I like Justin, I've been re-watching him, and what I've been doing is I'm watching him maybe 15 minutes at a time, and it's, and it's built on that cliffhanger structure, so you got to watch this bit, and then this bit, and this bit, and what I love is that the the bits inside of there where it is such a real, and again, I know people who've never seen it and go watch it today, it's pacing is different. It's pacing's different, it's weird, and it feels very 70s in some things, but it also felt like another planet it really felt like another world the way they went to locations i don't feel like at any time oh they're in a pipe factory in england right now like oh yeah, yeah no this is this is just shot out there in new mexico i don't feel like i always feel like i'm another planet the little details they went into when r2d2 and c3po are walking around in the desert in the background there's the dinosaur skeleton there's the skeleton of of the maybe the crate dragon which we turns out was Something they threw on the plane. They're flying over there, full of props. You told you this story? No, I haven't heard this. Oh, so that was yeah. They were when they were uh, when they were making. I guess maybe that was in Huck Stars Conquer the Universe when they're they're flying all their props over from England to Tunisia. They're grabbing everything they can around the the sets, Shepperton, whatever they can find. And they find this big, huge skeleton, which was from a Disney movie called One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing, about a dinosaur skeleton getting going missing. They threw it into the plane. Plane arrives. The set, you know, the the set designer. He's looking at this and he's like, "Oh, this is cool. We'll just put this in the background there." And it could have just as easily. It wasn't in the script. And had it, you know, and now because it's in the movie, it's canon, and there's a whole life story of what this thing is and what's going on there. <laughs> all those details, all the robots in the background. There's so much stuff going on there, and you pop into Star Wars like, "Oh yeah, here are Jawas. What are Jawas? Don't worry." No, we're not going to come back to them. Well, and, and this is one of the great things. And again, you capture a lot of that spirit when you read how Star Wars conquered the universe. In one of his interviews, I remember watching as a teenager, um, uh, 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 George Lucas says that the, the biggest mistake that science fiction directors make is that they're so proud of their sets and their design that they show them off. He says, mm -hmm. show it for 10 seconds, then blow it up instantly, as was his credo at the time. And of course, obviously, there's a case to be made that he very much changed his mind as he uh, grew older. Mm -hmm. But oh. uh, at that time, you know, that's that's what it was. And that's why everything moves so fast. You're like, wait, wait, whoa, whoa what's it, that? What's that? You know, what the jaw was, you think about this. For the sand crawler, we had, they built one external practical of the treads, which were, you know, they just redressed to be like it's either at the moisture farm or it's, it's you know, uh, where they got stopped in the middle of the desert. They had the tracks. They had an interior that they shot with, I love the low ceiling. If you look at it, you go, oh wow, it's got really low ceilings because they're Jawas, right? Yeah. And then they had a model shot. You know, that you get like, there are basically three things to establish the Jawas, how they lived, whatever. And then what are the Jawas? They're, we know they're, they're two feet off the ground. They've got glowing eyes. What do they look like underneath? Nah, it's not part of the story. It doesn't matter. Does not matter. What's underneath a Sheik's, a Sheik's turban? Doesn't matter. You know, we're not going to just dump in, just jump right into that. Yeah. So I think, you know, it just was – yeah, like that – like you just said, you just said that that was it. Just throw a bunch of stuff up there. And if you look – when you watch this on HD and you look at the sets real closely, you can see, wow, this was – this was put together pretty quickly. But, you know, they went to the effort of, you know, the, the prison corridor isn't a straight corridor. It's an octagonal. Oh, and it's you know? awful. It's – the perspective isn't even lined up. It's like I, I remember being confused as a kid. Like, okay, this, this, this hallway is like 30 feet long and then there's like a barrier – uh, with a picture of the rest of the hallway, I guess I don't like. I That's remember the design of the Death Star. I can I, we can explain away all that. I, I know, was. but but what's funny <laughs> is I was too busy being blown away oh, by yeah. everything. You know, you look at uh, it now, you can see like I can see the paint and how this, but it's it doesn't matter. It moves so fast, and 
And part of the thing that was illustrated in how Star Wars conquered the universe was how much like bringing in that Doctor Who mentality yeah. of just get it done, but just having go. a little bit more money and a little bit yeah. more time to do it. Well, and plus also, you know, the the talent that just was surrounding. You don't Makes expect it. all stars to be in charge of the music and the guy the guy writing the crawl to be you know one of the most influential directors in the next thirty years. Uh, re real space, quick, just just if you haven't seen it, right so weird. <laughs> 20th Century Fox and George Lucas, the man who brought you American graffiti, now <laughs> bring you an adventure unlike anything on your planet. Star Wars. Here they come. The story of a boy, a girl, and a universe. It's a big, sprawling space saga of rebellion and romance. It's a spectacle, light years ahead of its time. I am C-3PO, human cyborg relations, and this is my counterpart, R2-D2. Hello. It's an epic of heroes. Do, do you guys know what that music is or where that came from? Or, I mean, it's just so from weird. my dreams, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that, I don't know what soundtrack that was before. Uh, a thing I'll point out, and I actually have another pick, too, because I'm one, too. Um, watching Empire, when you're watching the Battle of Hoth and you look at the gun turrets, all right, you see little rust stains. Yeah, you know, and it's like we can get into Star Wars how great, but even then, it's like it looked like World War II equipment. The detail that they said, "Oh yeah, how, what happens if we're on a battleship?" Well, we'll see these little things. Those little details are wonderful. Um, my non-Star Wars pick, and it's a recommendation. It's this is kind of I sent it to Brian, uh, and and the magic vibe. There's a magician by the name of Luber Fiedler who is a really, really oh Apple Watch is telling me to stand up. Oh, who's a, <laughs> a really, really inventive guy who's created i think he's a uh, german originally and he's been a, a an amazing magic creator and i watched i found his youtube site where he has two videos up of his different kind of creativity there which and, which one do you want to take a peek at if we're only going to uh, see a little bit play i think play play start with one just see what inside luber fiedler's brain yeah, and it's funny because it's just it's like you hear it's like weird sort of like breathing noises as these visual magic tricks take place. Oh, dude, the uh, YouTube has made possible just the most amazing transformation where it's like so many things that we thought were important suddenly aren't. Oh, there he's we go. from the the Czech Re Republic. Apologize. So. Oh, so he's got like a, a blank white card, but then he waves a feather over it and through it you see like a nine of hearts. It looks a little bit like a crazy oh, green screen effect. Yeah. yeah, he originally was like a chemical engineer or whatever, so he's created a lot of these just way out of the box thinking. And Tenyo Magic Puzzles <laughs> uses a, a lot of, he, they, he, they've licensed stuff from him. <laughs> Oh, so By the way, he is the best person on earth. Like, there's nobody better than the man we are looking at right now. It's just this, like, obviously incredibly inventive magician. Uh, he's an older gentleman wearing an FBI <laughs> snapback and a Hollywood <laughs> t-shirt and a multicolored Hollywood t-shirt, which I'm he's sure like I'm sure was worn like to disprove certain ideas about the filter he just put up and down over his face, right? Yeah, that's I guess a good so. point. Um, and it's funny that it's so I was probably after a trip to the Magic Castle. So it's just these yeah, very, very that. visual things. But it's neat to see this is a, a magic thinker who's sitting around creating stuff. So the link will be up on the Weird Things page. So if you want to go there and take a look at, at the video for our audio listeners. Oh, my God, it. that was fantastic. He just he just showed both sides of a three of hearts and then tore it in half and it burst into flames like magically. That's exactly how I'd imagine a real spell to work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's great. So Luber Fiedler's YouTube. L U B O R F I E D L E R. Yeah. He's got so Tenyo is a as a Japanese line of magic products. They're pretty they're pretty clever stuff. Every year they put out new products and he's had they've done several Luber Fiedler releases cuz he does amazing thing with optics and stuff. 
and they're 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 just fun to play with. Uh, you know, you're kind of fun to sort of do on your own. And he's got some really cool things with lenses and stuff. And uh, you know, it's 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 very fascinating. It's, it's to all watch. optical stuff. It's all stuff uh, that um, uh, looks like it would be digital, but is not. And I know, uh, yeah. Justin, you have to go. So I'll uh, I'll make my pick super fast. Uh, my pick is not for you filthy Americans. My pick is for all of you fine folks in Europe. Uh, it's a little show that uh, you ever want to get ahead in life? You want to know tips and tricks of scientists and spies, of criminals and con artists? Well, if you have National Geographic and are in the UK or in Western Europe, you should check out Hacking the System, which premieres this week. And... Um, I'm very. Have you seen? Have you seen overdubbed versions? No, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah, I like I, the, like England. The like. What, uh, what's funny? The only thing I've seen so far is somebody took a photo of their their uh, local like uh, like reviews or their local TV guide, and of course, the one photo out of the entire series that they show is from the Fourth of July episode where I'm decked out in the most ridiculous stars and bars, you know, star spangled outfit ever. It's amazing. It's whack yank Brian Brushwood shows you. <laughs> and then in the review, it uh, it calls out the fact that he's like, be careful, though. Uh, he, he explains the exact techniques used by criminals as well. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's uh, careful uh, because you might get American obesity watching it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my pick. Uh, that's great. Everybody hacking the system. Send uh, at Schwood all of your, especially if it is in another language. But uh, any <laughs> yeah, any feedback on seeing hacking the system in, in the UK, go ahead and check that out. I can't wait. Gentlemen, it's been weird. <laughs> Take care, Justin. Thanks, man. Bye. Hey, uh, real quick, a bunch of people are asking why the video is fuzzy. Um, I suspect I, I have a theory about this. Uh, it was it, it was fuzzy in the pre-show. We, we've upgraded to Wirecast 6, so there's a few bugs that we're working out. Um, the bug we encountered last week was it was it was fuzzy, and then I restarted everything, and then it looked okay. Um, the the bug we had today was that uh, Justin couldn't get the uh, the virtual camera feed that I was sending him on on Skype so uh, so I changed up the order of booting things so I wonder if it's related I'm gonna shut the stream down for just a few seconds I'll restart it and uh, and we'll see if it's getting video so theoretically everyone's watching just a random black screen right now and if the problem is on the switching PC then I should still have it be fuzzy right now which it is so it's still fuzzy crap that's uh let me try let me try killing the virtual camera and then killing this we'll go back to blackness and then i'll go to let me switch the output to and this is all assuming we can fix it live so right now you're not seeing anything right I see our frozen frames. Good. All right. Aha. Yeah. So now I'm going to restart it. Wow, this is going to suck. I'm going to have to start the virtual camera. <coughs> nope. Well, shit. Now, uh, now it won't let me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, shoot. I'm going to have to restart this call to you. Okay. <coughs> uh, so I'm going to hang up. I'm going to close, I guess I got to close all of the uh, virtual camera out, start. All right, so now it's letting me. And now I will call Andrew Main, question mark. All right. Who is it? Wow, man. That's a, that's a lot to do. That's a lot of hoopla. Sorry, I'm just looking at Instagram on my Apple Watch. I don't blame you, man. If I were you, I'd totally look at Instagram, too. Uh, yeah. is it pretty great? Just tell me it's pretty great. That's all. It displays fantastic. I, I mean, it, it's it's that hardware wise, display wise, all that. It's all going to be the apps, you know. As a as a quick glance, look down and see what's going on. I mean, again, I'm going to curious to see, you know, like I've got like my Skype notifications here as far oh, as. Hang on, let me uh, let me make you bigger. Let me embiggen you. You know, it, it's going to be one of those things you figure out. Like, I'm a guy who does who uses very few 
notifications. So those yeah. are all the Skype ones right now, like to say like, oh, Brian's bothering you. Brian wants attention. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Brian's a needy little child. Um, you know, and it's neat like for uh, – you know, it's it's really cool when your friend has one. So Chris Kenner has one. Yep. And so I'm not I'm I'm not I'm not claiming I did it. You know, maybe some obscene photo drawings started appearing on his watch. <laughs> sure, sure. And maybe ten seconds later, obscene drawings appeared on my watch. Oh, and uh, the boner pick. Yeah. So uh, you know, that's gonna be a thing between everybody. And it's like like I'm like, who else do I know that have one? I'm like, oh I know. Like, I mean I know there's like some sixteen year old kid who's a fan of mine. I'm like, no, I don't think I'll be <laughs> <laughs> No boner <laughs> fix for that kid. I gotcha. And when you feel that the, the haptic stuff, it, it's a you know the, the 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 way the tapping and all that feels, it's different. It's very, very different. You know, I spent I spent half an hour last night showing Jack Goldfinger all the different little ins and outs with it, you know. And That's awesome. Uh, what what does Jack Goldfinger think of it? Oh, he love. I mean, Jack Jack loves. He's good with everything, man. He's, he's a class a act. That one. Pure sweet soul. He's just. But uh. uh hey, man. Uh, I, I I got a short one. I do have uh I do have commitments. Um, I got to help out with a bunch of family stuff. So, uh, we, do you think we can get away with keeping it closer to twenty twenty five minutes? Just listen, man. You you call it when you need to call it. Uh, <laughs> all right. I know you can go all night long. Uh, all right. Here, oh, take yeah, it away, right. sir. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Maine, joined by Brian Brushwood. And that's Brian, it. I'm going to get things started right away here. Yeah, man, let's just jump right in. Uh, I didn't really have a topic lined I didn't. up, uh, but but I know that 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 uh, stuff that's on our minds. Uh, you know what? Can we talk about? Uh, you know, one of the things that we do in After Things is we sort of peel back the veneer over our public personas and talk a little mo more about the difficulties of trying to make it in our respective entertainment businesses and getting ahead and making score. art I did that we say like. I had a topic, just so you know. Okay, Brian, please oh, go ahead. Wait, you did have a topic? Yes, I said I did. But so, please, 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 go ahead. Talk. Okay. You're already peeling back the veneer. You've already okay. got a lead. you got to go with this now. Well, I don't know. Um, I'm currently preoccupied thinking about health-related stuff and about how I've sort of... Um, it's very weird for me when I was touring, uh, just life was touring and however my health was, was nothing I could affect when I was home, I could work out. And the rest of the time it's, I had to eat whatever was available and work out if I happen to have an hour free. But now that it's sort of like, you know, a few weeks at home, then go out for a week to do a TV thing in Vegas, then come back or whatever. Um, I'm really excited about, uh, about the opportunity to get consistent results and uh, and see where, where stuff's headed. Um, last time we talked about this topic, I guess, was a month ago. And I was talking about all the crazy vegetables I was eating. And I still go to that. But when I'm on the road, it's nice to, in that environment, have permission to eat whatever, whenever, and then come back home and then get back to the grind. And it, I'm in a weird place where it feels really, really good. Uh, you know, when you, anytime you exercise control over what you're doing, anytime that you make a conscious effort and you decide to change something and you see a result, it is very affirming. It is, and it, it's one of these things that you, you want to pursue more and more. And then often we, we get into situations where we then kind of get out of it. Like I will get into these kicks where I'll be, you know, get healthy, but then I'll go get, you know, go to convention or something like that. And I have, you know, my, I have, my immune system is like, for nothing. I mean, I just, I'm such a loner. I'm never exposed to these things. So I get sick, I get out of it, and then I forget to go do it. But when you do get on top of stuff, like I've only been eating like one meal a day the last four or five days, partially because I'm sick, but now I'm liking it because, you know, I mean, it, the, the weight's been coming off and I'm like, oh, this is cool. Like, you know what? I used to do that a long time ago. You know, when I would, when I was my weighed the least as an adult, like, I only ate like once a day, and like, oh, I'm gonna well, go try that again. And you, uh, uh, it was you that forwarded me that book or that article on how long it takes to get unhealthy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was an interesting article about how quickly you can get out of shape, which is a couple weeks. But the converse of that is, when I started doing my workout routine, I was saw within a week, I was getting back gains that had taken me months before to to put together. So that's the upside about that is you can lose it quickly, but if you get back in with high intensity. It doesn't take you as long to get to where you were, man. And I'll tell you what, like you know, last year because we had the TV thing, uh, I got I got pretty pretty fit. Um, I, I I still haven't seen 142 again, which is in my in my I'm still 30 mindset. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, is where I think I belong. But I did get down to 145, and the difference was 
you know, I remember in January watching the the footage, which was shot during the summer, and I'm like, holy crap, I used to be fit. I'm a slob now because I was, you know, 10 pounds heavier. And then, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm two-thirds of the way back there. Uh, it's, it's, it's a long slog to get back in, in, in tip top because you get those diminishing returns, right? There's a certain level at which you, you can't, you know, you, you have bones and you have water in your body and you can't plow through those, those borders. Yeah. Yeah. And you can certainly, you know, if, if you really have to absolutely need to, you know, radically lose weight. It's very, very doable, but if you're trying to make a lifestyle change, that's not the same path you want to take. You know, if, if like, you know, I'm like, Brian, we got a grudge next week, next Sunday, I'm knocking on your door and we're fighting mano a mano, you know, <laughs> nothing you can do. Richard Garriott's got a million dollars on the line, you know. Uh- You'll find a way to get in shape. Oh, absolutely. Well, you know. and plus also, and this is something that uh, Freakonomics did a, a whole episode on, was talking about the the synergistic way that you can tie uh, short-term pleasures to stuff that normally you don't like to do. You know, and they, they did experiments where you listen to an audiobook while you work out, and people found mm-hmm. that it's like once they tied the experience of getting that story along with working out, people got really excited about working out. And uh, I know for me, while you do your taxes, it's a TurboTax recommendation, I think. Yeah, exactly. Well, and for me, uh, I know that uh, that uh, almost all of the the playing of the the crack like uh, Hearthstone that I do is on a uh, stationary bike, and so it's like I get really excited about an hour to two hours of uh, of of just sitting oh, down yeah. and 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 riding a bike, which of course I, I lost I like six pounds walking, listening to how Star Wars conquered the universe because I didn't want to go in. I just wanted to keep walking around the neighborhood. Well, I, and, and when you move, I didn't realize this until I saw you down at Star Wars Celebration. Like when you walk, maybe it's the few extra inches you have on me vertically, but like you move fast. You don't you don't mess around on your walks. Oh yeah, I'm a fat. Yeah, I, I, I. And, but you know, it's that you know, thinking fast, thinking slow. They talk about that optimum sort of speed. When like I have my speed, if I go faster, then I can't think slower, and then I'm, I'm going too slow. Uh, but for sure, um, I want to touch upon a sort of a thought, and kind of it's a crystallization of, of of an approach that I've been developing, and that is, I've had some things magically that I've been working on. I've got a new magic book I'm working on, but then, like, first, for my own act, I've got some things I've been developing, and I've had some stuff that I'm like, oh, you know, I'm interested in this, I'm interested in this sort of stuff. And the dancing handkerchief is a trick that fascinates me because it's, you know, when something comes alive and it moves around, it's neat. It's not a levitation, per se. Maybe you use similar magical technologies, but really it's supposed to be the animation of an object that becomes alive. And as a storyteller, I love this. Well, And plus also from a practical standpoint, it's fascinating because there are so many different ways you could do it, which means you can take different handkerchiefs, each one using a different method, and all ostensibly being the same handkerchief, one can use one method to animate itself, and then later you can disprove that method because now it's, you know, uh, there's been a replacement and it's another method. You get, you get in compound methods and all that. And so I was at the Magic Castle last Sunday and I wanted to do some research into it. And as I'm walking through the Magic Castle through the lobby, I run into a guy by the name of Raymond Crow. Are you familiar with Raymond Crow, the mm. Australian magician? No, I'm not. Raymond Crow is amazing. He calls himself an unusualist. He was one of the – did really, really well on, on Australia. He's got talent. He was part of the Illusionist Tour. He does a combination of magic, mime. He does hand shadows. He does hand shadows to It's a Wonderful World, which is an amazing sort of piece. I highly recommend you type in Raymond Crow. It's Crow spelled C-R-O-W-E. And he's got uh, – some amazing handlings on stuff. He has a routine that he does called the Naked Zombie Ball. In Magic, there's an effect called the zombie invented by a guy named Joe Carson where the silver ball floats behind this phallard and in front and moves around. And there's a method to do this. There's a secret magic technology to do this. And, and Raymond Crow came up with his own way of using that that doesn't use any of that. That's more just him as a magician and a mime, whatever, making this thing work. And so... Uh, his he's amazing. So I ran into him at the Magic Castle. Wow. And I'm like, oh, this is great because here I am doing some research onto this stuff. And I sat down and had a conversation with him for about an hour. And it was amazing. It was just sort of sort of kind of a gift to talk to this guy with his resources and then his the way he approaches stuff. And then him making some very good points about, well, this works because of this. This works because of that. Or that doesn't work because of that. And it got me thinking too about you know, I have to sit down and say, what do I love about this routine? 
what forget about the method, forget about the technology, and the same thing with the story. You say, what do I love about it? And I was talking about another magician who's put a lot of time and effort into a routine. I'm like, okay, you want to make this work. You have to say what you love about it. Start with what you love about it and what you won't give away and then move from there. And so that's what I've been going through is I've been looking at this thing saying, what do I love here? What do I love? And then what makes it work? And, and then from like the animated, the dancing handkerchief, I was looking at that saying, okay, what makes this, where is it most powerful for the audience? And it's most powerful for an audience, I think, when it's inside of a jug and you think that there are no wires. Magicians may like it when it flies around and all that, but I think people think, you know, even when there aren't, they think, oh, there are wires or this or that. And, and that's an approach I'm trying to use now to get more to it is like, just write down what's best about something and then figure out another way to get there. So I'm trying really hard to figure out which book uh, I learned it from. Uh, but there's, um, uh, I want to say it's How to Fly a Horse, uh, mm -hmm. if, if I was going to guess. Uh, that, that, that may be wrong. I've been really on a, a, a bender on uh, Audible books. Uh, but, um, yeah, let's say it's how to fly a horse, but he talks a lot about the curse of knowing how mm -hmm. once you know a thing, it's extremely difficult to view any problem through the lens of, of not knowing and, uh, and, and in magic, yes, yeah. yes, we have it very, very bad. And, and he talks about how, uh, you know, the more creative, the more, uh, uh extraordinary, uh, solutions almost always come from the outside. This is why outsiders come in and disrupt entire industries. Mm-hmm. I've got it. I'm going to, you know, when we're offline, I'm going to show you something and explain it. Like, here's a method. Oh, you know I'll what? Neshcom says it might be made to stick. If, if, if yeah. that's where you remember it from, Neshcom, then maybe it was made to stick because yeah. I also well, read that around the same time. I'll show you something while I go, like, here's this really cool technology that magicians love. Yet here's this other, here's this, here's this $1,000 thing and here's this $15 thing and tell me which is better. And, you know, and, and that's what's interesting about that is, is that you, we, we certainly fall in, we get very much in love with our solutions and the knowledge of stuff and we have to step back. I have a, a new book I'm writing and I have to, I had, I had one way I wanted to do it, but I didn't, I was hesitating. I thought like, well, I came up with this way to do it because I think I have to do this because of what I did before or to make this different. But I said, if I'm not passionate about it, maybe I need to step back and just say, okay, what makes this good? Does the location make it good? No, the location doesn't make it good. And, and I didn't know I was going to write it in a foreign country. I'm like, I've never been there. I don't know anything about it. And maybe I need to just change it and then combine it with something else that I love that I never thought about connecting it to. Yeah. Uh, I, and by the way, it does look like uh, a quick Google search. Uh, it appears that they definitely talk about it made to stick. So that must be where I heard it from. Uh, made to stick was fantastic, by the way, uh, as was contagious. Uh, but in fact, preemptively, those are my repicks after uh, after we already discussed those on weird things. And I think I think that in following, <coughs> you know, kind of stepping away from stuff and when you have different bodies of knowledge, you know, I'll put Raymond Crow's videos would be my pick because Here's a guy that he loves, like Charlie Chaplin. He loves sort of old time stuff. And we watch his 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 performances. He incorporates that. He's got these. He's got up on his Facebook page. You look at Facebook. He's got a really actually go take a look at that on his Facebook page. <laughs> yeah, the uh, uh, again spell his name again for me. Raymond Crow C R O W E. Crow, got it. So let's go Facebook. Unusualist. Then, there we go. Checking it out right now. Um, and this is a guy that took several different things that he loves. I think there's a video we we scroll down on uh, da, 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 da. the yeah, it's the the one where he's standing on stage. It says uh, from April eighth. Uh, April. Oops, I wrote peril. So let me write April eighth instead. There, you there go. we go. This one right here. Yep. All right, so we're taking a look at uh, a link to one of his past stage shows. Audio wanna... listeners, just go to the Facebook page for Raymond Crow, Unusualist. So he's, it looks like he's pulling out a little ukulele here. Yeah. Uh, do we want to listen to this? Or... Yeah. It's, yeah, listen to it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And by the way, this, uh, I can tell already that this is going to resonate with the advice Teller gave me of have heroes outside of magic. You know, it's like magic doesn't need more magicians who have magicians as heroes. Excuse me, this may be important. Excuse me. So he's uh, pulling over some gear. He's got a ukulele on his back. Uh, he's, he's futzing around with some various equipment. Um, 
All of which looks... You can turn his audio up so we can hear him. Yeah, no, it's it's unfortunately very just poor audio. It's a gift from the theater. I, I, I was here in January with the Illusionist 2.0, and the staff here is so friendly, as you probably discovered when you came in. Um, at the last night we were here, they had a big party for us. And to tell you the truth, I don't even remember what happened at the end, end of the night. <laughs> Apparently he's a baby from when he was there a year before, right? Right. The baby noise is him. He's making that noise. That's himself. that's ventriloquism happening right now. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, he's pulled out a mirror to compare himself. Now, skip ahead, because what happens is just where this is going to go is amazing. It's a great thing. Is he's got a box with presumably a baby we never see. Oh, there we go. There we go. And so we're seeing like sh shadowography. Is that? Yeah, it's right? a shadow. We see now a shadow. It's like a big circle with a shadow of it. And now it's an entire play playing out in shadows with him acting real time, interacting with little cutout silhouettes. Oh, this is great. So you could tell from the focus that the silhouettes are at a different uh, focal distance than he is, but he's using mime to interact with all of these objects to make it look like he's leaning on a banister or setting a box on a, on this on the railing of a uh, of a of a porch. Uh, that's phenomenal. He just walked down to the first floor of a building, realized he left the baby on. Again, this is done with him, one bulb, somebody with a, just moving a silhouette in front of the light bulb, and yet we're watching a movie that involves a several story building, an airplane now. <laughs> <laughs> a reference to uh, a King Kong. Wow, is that well choreographed. And this is a guy that's created, you know, this amazing bit of visual magic and delight using, you know, like as you said, his, his influences are, you know, here, Harold Lloyd, Charlie Chaplin, and it's, you know, when you're in a theater, and I've never seen this live, but you're in a theater watching this, and now... <laughs> oh, that's great, and he's doing individual scenes, like it, it cuts to a close-up of him hanging on the side of a uh, of, of a pole, and then and I, I assume it's him acting out a spider tickling his fingers yep. so that he lets go of the flagpole and falls down. Yeah, there's no video here. It's just all live. That's extraordinary. You know, uh, he, here's the thing, is stuff like this may have seemed, I, I, I would say certainly at home in the vaudeville era, possibly aspects of it, cliche in the vaudeville era, but as we enter an age where millennials are going to uh, 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 have a substantially more important um, hand in deciding, you know, what what's popular or not, uh, I suspect that all of a sudden that is the white hot place to get any, everyone's attention. For example, like um, people ask me all the time, they're like, where do you get your ideas for a scam school? And we're creeping up on 400 episodes. And, and weirdly, because I got my start reading everything, uh, I, I and, and you know, th th there has been friction about like what is and isn't appropriate to put on scam school. So my solution has been to just go older and older for source materials. And now I find it very, very easy for me to find a book from the 1920s where no one can lay any claim to anything on it and use that as inspiration and figure out a way to present it in a 21st century appropriate environment. And to me, this is no more difficult than learning my first tricks when, you know, 20, 20 years ago. And yet to anyone under the age of 25, when they're like, where can I get original ideas? Uh, I say at the library, you can read a book and be inspired by it. It's as though I'm telling them, to go to Mars. You know, all you yeah. got to do is fly over to Mars and grab yourself some ideas. And I suspect that's just going to be more and more. That is the ability to, in, to, to research in a boring, tedious format is going to be a more and more valuable commodity in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. For sure. I, I know that, you know, going to, in this case, what I've been working on, going to the library, I'm going to go there in, in an hour or two go back there to go do some more research on stuff. It gives you a wide variety of stuff and then sit down. I'm lucky that I can go talk to experts and people like this who know this. There's a there's a guy I'm going to try to go talk to tonight who is a performer of the castle who was the chief puppeteer for Team America. Wow. So, uh, you know, but, you, you know, in your own case, you can find these different ways to do this research on stuff, but ask a lot of questions. And that's my my frustration from it, like I have friends who perform at the castle and I'll watch them go do a trick and I'm like, wow, 
It's a great trick. It's a wonderful trick. Everybody does this trick. I would probably do this trick in a corporate show, but you're at the castle. You've got the most amazing amount of resources in the world that you could hope for to find material. You go into that library. You grab five books off the shelf. You find something just as good or better that's not been seen in 50 years. But we we were cautious. We want to go with what we've seen what's work, and we will often make that choice to do what everybody else has done because at least we know that works. And that's often we tell people to be original. We forget about that. But then the solution is how do you make that work? How do you find a place that's, to that's make it good? That's the funny part is that is that strangely we tell people to be original, but we don't mean that at all because original implies that you're creating in a vacuum. What we're saying is is draw from influences outside of what's currently popular or what's currently, you know, in the in the metagame of your discipline, of your art, draw from outside that. So we're 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 essentially we're saying the words be original, but by original we mean, you know, copy and, and remix something farther outside your current sphere. Yeah, but I mean I think that I think that Anytime you put two things together that haven't been together, that's pretty original. Oh, and, no, 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 I, I, and, I, I, absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I would say but, there is there is this in the in the copy remix culture. There is some th there has been this sort of almost a dismissive attitude, like, well, and it's not you, but there is this. Well, nothing's original. It's like, well, but but oftentimes the problem is is that's oftentimes justification to borrow something that's currently popular and yeah, you know, like, or, or, or from ten you know, years yeah. ago or whatever. Yeah, right. and that gets yeah, and that gets to be like I agree. That's, you know, that, that we, is we saw it. Well, we saw Raymond Crow just do with the, the shadows and that. Like, yeah, I mean, I mean that thing I may have been done like eighty years ago, but he created an original little playette to do with this and do that. And 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 it's so much more rewarding. But the problem is, like, how do you how do you make it good or how do you do that? And I've been picking up a lot of little fun magic here, and it's like, great. I need to find places to go do this. You know, where nobody cares that you know I'm the guy from TV failing at something because. You know, that's the thing, man. You got to find a safe space to be bad. And mm -hmm. and it's it's harder and harder. And it's like, even though nobody's watching at the moment that you're originally trying it, you also have to recognize it's on the record forever. And then if if you become super famous for this act, that footage of you trying it and doing it badly will suddenly become extraordinarily valuable and, and, and precious the way we felt about uh, the bootlegs of the Beatles or, or Bob Dylan. Yeah, I just think that in magic's different. Magic is you 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 don't if your if your goal is to be a magician, you don't want to have video of you being bad at it out there. Uh, I mean, certainly, I I I don't think you want video of you being bad at music either out there, or bad at stand up comedy. Yeah, I mean, but we understand the growth in music. Everybody sits down at a piano and knows this is where they start, where they end up, and where magic, where the technique is supposed to be invisible or is supposed to be hidden. I don't I don't know that. I mean, certainly, you won't be fooled when you watch a bad uh, magic act, but also when you watch bad comedy eventually evolve into good comedy, you don't laugh. I mean, it's short of the dividing line. I mean, that's the reason that uh, Patton Oswalt went on a tear against that one person who thought they were doing him a favor, you know, uh, uh, bootlegging his set that he was still ironing out on. You know what I mean? I missed what was the first part. Oh, I, I, I was going to say I, I, I would liken it to comedy acts because comedy acts uh, up to a certain point, they're just not funny. And then they cross that 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 line and then they become yeah. polished and I mean, well I, enough that I, they become I funny. have like in me, I think magic, there's a part of the wall that mm -hmm. I do not like to in, in, a, in my form of presentation. I don't like to show. I don't like to say, let's go behind her and go look at this because it becomes less interesting. Uh, and that's my, you know, that's the way I, I approach things. And and I've turned down stuff in magic and shows that I thought were done really well. But I go, no, this show gets into process, and I don't want to get into that part of process because yeah. that that is, it's it's not as you know, magician is inherently interesting sort of person. You know, like you 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 know you you take take a show like uh, Penn and Teller fool us. David Copperfield probably would not be a judge on a show like that because David Copperfield is supposed to be the greatest magician of all time and arguably is. Right. He's not going to put himself in a position where he's going to see somebody perform and then say, I don't know. You fooled me. Yes. Whereas, personally, whereas personally, he would tell you. He would have, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. Whatever. But the persona probably is never going to be like right. capital D, know. capital C. Whereas, you know, Penn and Teller, their brand and their personality is, is very iterative. And they certainly have, you know, but. I, I know of, of, you know, from prior thing, I know people who've been on there and fooled them and they did not, they would not admit it. <laughs> oh, what do you mean? Oh, oh, Penn and Teller wouldn't admit it? 
Yeah, they're like, oh yeah, no, no, like, what, like, do you know? But they were not, they didn't know. They, you know, that's that was what's funny. It's like I know of a couple instances like that where like, oh, it's the, the it's this thing or whatever, and it's like, mm, you know, so but, you know, and and they've they've been open about a lot of that stuff. You hear about the stories of uh, Penn has talked on his podcast about the stories of like they think they know, and then Johnny Thompson has to explain like, uh, nope, sorry, boys, yeah, <laughs> I'm the I'm the judge, and I say you didn't get it. Yeah, uh, but anyhow, I mean, yeah, and that's it's because it's. It's we all we all fall into that. Oh, I know, I know this, I know this, and then it's a delightful thing when you go, oh wow, yeah, I know. dude. I, you know what? Made to stick, man. Talk about the curse of knowledge. Here's the quote that uh, that I really dug uh, from Made to Stick. Uh, quote, and that brings us to the villain of our book, the curse of knowledge. Lots of research in economics and psychology shows that when we know something, it becomes hard for us to imagine not knowing it. As a result, we become lousy communicators. Think of a lawyer who can't give you a straight, comprehensible answer to a legal question. His vast knowledge and experience renders him unable to fathom how little you know. So when he talks to you, he talks in abstractions that you can't follow. And we're all like the lawyer in our own domain of expertise. And I absolutely agree with it. Yep, 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 yep. <sighs> Man, I gotta, I gotta run, unfortunately. It's gonna have to be a short after things. Ah, uh, sir, well, it was a pleasure. It's been after. Thanks. Perfect. Saving it. Save, copy as. Do you have titles? Uh, follow what you love. Follow what you love, unless you love murder. Well, you know, let's not <laughs> roll everything then, out. I'm in for weird things. Flocka, flocka, flocka. Uh, have you seen Raymond Crow's Naked Zombie Ball? No. Should I put it on right now? Yes. Uh, Raymond Crow, Raymond Crow. Oh, uh, yeah, and, and specifically, like, um, uh, that's the reason I, I started uh, thinking about uh, the curse of knowledge is um, how do you take a pre-existing act that has a very specific method and decide, I love that trick, What? how would I do it if I didn't know how it was done? Mm-hmm. Good zombie. Let's do. Man, that's extraordinary. So, 
Yeah, so for the people watching non magicians, there's the, the it, he took a trick that uses a gimmick and a cloth, and he got rid of the gimmick and the cloth, and he did a version that's better. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, all right, buddy. I have the uh, file uploading. I'm going to run and go take care of some other bees. Uh, I will catch you later. Bye. So long. I forgot to put us on.